Hello and welcome. Assalamu alaikum to everyone. Thank you for joining us, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are delighted to welcome you to today's session on Islamic social finance. This is the third part of our three part series on Islamic finance and the SDGs that has been running alongside the UN General Assembly. We have covered topics on green and sustainable sukuk yesterday uh, and earlier today we've covered topics on Islamic finance, uh, commercial opportunity, so, sorry, green and sustainable Islamic finance, commercial opportunity or operational headache. Um, <clears throat> once again, this year, the UK Islamic Finance Council has run these sessions to ensure that there is a voice for Islamic finance at the UN General Assembly. Um, and our work builds on this uh, activity of the Council in the Global Islamic Finance and UN SDGs Task Force, uh, which you can see on our website at ukrc.com forward slash SDG, which was launched by the UK government together with Islamic Development Bank in 2020 and aimed to promote awareness and adoption of the SDGs amongst commercial Islamic financial institutions. The task force and the work of the Islamic Finance Council has resulted in a number of publications. You'll see them on the website around Islamic finance and the SDGs, Islamic finance and the PRI, PRB, etc., and Islamic uh, Sharia and the SDGs as well, looking at the tension points between the two. We're grateful to all our partners for their support in bringing this session together, uh, including a uh, Majesty's Treasury, DD Cap Group, Emirates NBD, Gatehouse Bank, the Global Ethical Finance Initiative. Islamic Development Bank, the London Stock Exchange Group, and of course, the United Nations team uh, for all their ongoing support. Today's session, this final session over the next 60 minutes will be a quick fire session where we will look at Islamic social finance. I'm delighted to be joined by two excellent experts. The first half will be myself and Dr. Ahmed Al Mariki, and thereafter we'll be joined by Dr. Amjad Saki. So, a bit of housekeeping points before we kick off with Dr. Ahmed is please do engage in this discussion. You can put your questions in the question box below and indeed in the chat box as well. Uh, and if you're on social media, then please use tag us in at, at UK underscore IFC or use the hashtags UNGA77 or IFSDG2022. I should say, sorry, IFSDG22, I should say. Now, if I may, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. El Mariki to give his opening remarks to the virtual stage. Dr. El Mariki is was appointed as the special advisor to the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres in December 2019, and in line with the Secretary General's vision and efforts to address the root cause of humanitarian disasters and conflicts, to take more preventative measures and improve the quality of the United Nations response. Dr. El Mariki is appointed to support. The Secretary General, ongoing outreach and broadening and strengthening engagement and dialogue with member states. Dr. Elmariki, welcome and please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Omar. Uh, if you allow me to give the, the speech, I would like to say, ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, it's my pleasure to join you today and speak at this crucial time. I'd like to thank uh, UK, IFC, and their partner uh to bring us uh, together and i'm joining uh now from new york where global reader leaders are opening uh, the u.n general assembly debating the world's biggest challenges this is the same place where in september 2015 world leaders adopted the 2030 agenda and the 17 sustainable development goals. Less than a decade remains to attain the DSG and trends already, trends already headed in the wrong direction remain unchecked. The effects of the COVID-19 pandemic continue to set back development while a new variant uh, threaten future stability. Meanwhile, Conflict in Ukraine and elsewhere means more people than ever before are suffering. The worst impact are in developing country, countries among those already vulnerable. 
collective action is essential to make any progress on the DSG. Uh, I mean, on any progress on the SDGs and improving resilience. As Muslim, we have unique tools that can and should be leveraged to help achieve the SDGs. In January 2016, the high level panel on humanitarian finance report to the Secretary General specifically highlighted the very real potential that Islamic social finance financing has to help address the challenges of ending extreme poverty, boosting shared prosperity, and achieving the SDGs. Since 2016, the UN has explored ways to harness the power of Islamic social financing tools, such as awqaf, zakat, and sadaqat, to implement UN projects, but more importantly, to aligning, to align funding flows with SDGs. Many of UN agencies have began exploring innovative new Islamic financing partnership and instruments. Later this week, UNHCR will announce, alongside the Islamic Development Bank, the establishment of the Global Islamic Fund for Refugees. We have also seen UNICEF and the Islamic Development Bank establish a global zakat platform for children. The Organization of Islamic Corporation has agreed with the UNRWA establish AUQA for Palestinian. UNDP in Indonesia has worked to allocate funds for the National Social Finance Body, uh, BANZNAS, for UNDP uh, implemented project. You can see that the UN is trying hard to think out of the box to meet the SDGs in the time frame and help our world, but each agency is working in silo. As the UN Secretary General's Special Advice, Advisor, on Islamic social finance, I am tasked with looking at what the UN can do as a system to utilize these special Islamic tools. So in May 2021, a high level event led jointly by the UN Deputy Secretary General and President of Islamic Development Bank serve as a platform to launch the international dialogue on the role of Islamic social financing in achieving the SDGs. Till the end of 2021, a series of 12 virtual seminars took place. They were designed to foster a better understanding of both Islamic social financing mechanism and the existing UN platforms such as those of UNHCR and UNICEF and UNRWA. The outcomes of and, and thoughts from those seminars were gathered and put into a report that is now being used to develop a concrete recommendations. We are now in period of consultation with the UN and Islamic Development Bank partners to ensure that the recommendations from the report are actionable. Zakat, Sadaqat, and Awqaf provide a valuable and mostly untapped resources which could be better harnessed to close the SDG financing gap and provide much needed liquidity to vulnerable countries and communities, especially in light of COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Dr. Mariki, for your opening remarks there. Um, now, this is a very, very critical and interesting space where Islamic finance and Islamic economic thinking provides a unique perspective, I believe, on the global stage. As you very rightly mentioned, this is the critical decade for action, 
And unfortunately, as certain estimates say we are not going to reach the 2030 target because of these recent volatilities and disruptions in global markets. Um, and indeed, many people think that could be the pattern going forward as well, as we now are in a cost of living crisis of inflation, etc. Um, and the war in Ukraine continue, continues and other geopolitical tensions arise. Um, now, alongside this, we're still struggling with you know, the devastation of climate change, as we see with the Pakistan floods as well, uh, more, more recently, and the devastation that has reaped across the country. When it comes to Islamic social finance specifically, there is some unique characteristics I would welcome your, your views on. And particularly for, for those in the audience, if I can just simplify or not familiar with it. So we have Sadaqa, which could be akin to a donation, a simple donation. Zakat being the mandatory two and a half percent that's required for those who can afford to pay such. Um, and that Zakat, uh, I'll come back to that in a second. And, and the Alkaf sector, which is what we see as the origins of the trusts and the endowment world here in the Western world actually originates from the Islamic uh, principle of waqf and endowment, where money is put aside, the capital is protected, and the yield is used for social causes. When it comes to zakat, uh, Dr. Omariki, there are very specific categories where that money can be spent. And I often say this, interestingly, you cannot use that money to build a mosque, for example. But one of the areas you can use that money is to forgive the debt of the person who is indebted which opens the door beautifully to blended finance, as we understand it today, where you take first loss or you take uh, a debt relief provision and integrate that into a financing structure that is blended with social and commercial components, which allows that commercial sector to open up and unlock, or the sector fundamentally just to get finance, which otherwise the commercial sector wouldn't touch. Can you tell us a bit more around the role of Islamic social finance in driving that blended finance component specifically? Thank you, Omar, for this question. I, if, if we come, want to, to talk about blend, blending uh, finance, it's, there is a, a three uh, key characters, characteristics for uh, the blended uh, financing, which is financial return, addresses SDGs or key development challenges. And the third one is donor and philanthropic uh, financing is catalyst. So if I, if I may say this is more, it is like awqaf, more than zakat, but the zakat can, can actually adapt it two of two because the, uh, two of these three uh, characteristics, whereas the zakat, there is no uh, financial return, but the, the awqaf, there is a financial return in, in, uh, in awqaf. So what I'm trying to say, uh, how can we utilize the Islamic social finance um, tools to help the people to get out of the uh, like poverty and try to use these tools to implement uh, and fill the gap for the SDGs. So if we if we use the the awqaf in a proper way, I think it will fill all the gaps for the SDGs. And also, if we uh, look to the to the zakat, uh, there is um, I think uh, Islamic uh, Development Bank has um, a, a study that the total amount or annual amount of money from the zakat it is around 600 billion dollars so you can imagine i don't i'm not thinking about the 600 million billions uh, dollars but even 100 or even 50 billions it will be uh, i mean uh, it will it will help to fill the gaps Maybe transformative, exactly. So then what exactly is the issue that you're seeing, Dr. Ahmed? Is it that the money is not being collected? Is it the money is not being distributed efficiently? Or is it that we're simply not reporting against the SDGs? Which, or is it something else? No, there is, there is actually some kind of efforts from the um, zakat uh, entity in many of the Islamic words, uh, I mean, in Islamic countries. 
But what we what we need actually to build here, uh, Omar, is the trust. The problem is there is no a mechanism that everyone can trust on that mechanism. So even even though some of the uh, Islamic countries has their own entity, but the people who who paid the zakat or who paid or uh, paid for awqaf or even sadaqat, sometimes they are looking for the trusted body that they can pay for for their deed because it is it is a kind of um, worship that we are doing it as a Muslim for Allah subhanahu wa taala. So this is why what, what we are what we need here we need to find that kind of entity that we can trust then we can pay and the Muslim can pay for this uh, this uh, this entity and this is what I'm trying to do actually with the UN to have a system that can uh, the, the reliable system that help all the Muslim all over the world. I'm not talking about the Muslim in, in the Muslim countries, but also I'm talking the Muslim all over the world, even the Western uh, country. How can they, they pay their uh, zakat, they pay their uh, awqaf, they pay their uh, sadaqat within the system that take care for the SDGs and take care for the poor people and uh, and and it is it is a trusted system and this is what we need actually uh, and this is what I'm trying to do with the UN to have a kind of um, a mechanism that uh, uh, will be within uh, the, uh, the the international system. Another major component. So I think that's a very interesting point on trust, um, Dr. Murike. And I can I see your perspectives there because just in the UK, for example, the British Muslim community give over two hundred million pounds a year in in charitable donations, which is makes them one of the most um, kind of giving community per capita here in, in Britain. So there definitely is a trust question, but there's also another big issue we see around just disclosure and reporting um in terms of has this has this reached the the, the recipients um and what's demonstrating reporting some transparency around the impact of that and of course the sdgs has largely been adopted globally as the principal primary globally accepted benchmark for the 17 you know goals the 300 plus kind of targets and then the indicators there or 170, sorry, targets and, 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 the, and the indicators. So it's, where do you see the SDGs as a mechanism that can enhance reporting, um, but also then address your issue of trust? If, if you look to the SDGs, uh, you will find that uh, it is coming with Maqasid al-Sharia. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, uh, we did a kind of uh, a connection between the Maqasid Sharia and the SDGs. And we found most of it, they are aligned on, uh, with the Maqasid Sharia, where is the people, and this is where the people want to, to, to spend their money and their sadaqat and their, uh, their zakat. So if we're talking about poverty, uh, the, the the zakat uh, you can spend the zakat for the poverty. If you uh, talking about uh, education, uh, shelter, uh, the awqaf uh, also uh, uh, contribute on on that. Uh, I will come back to to you regarding uh, reporting and transparency. Uh, in the end of the day, as a Muslim, I have to pay for uh, because the the Islam. Uh, and uh, uh, as a worship that uh, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have to, to pay our zakat, our sadaqat, our uh, uh, also awqaf who can, can pay for sadaqat. So what is missing here? What is the proper project that we can spend it on uh, one? Second, is there any visibility for those, uh, those projects? Uh, and and uh, and we can as as a a donor, I want to see what I spend. I want to see the impact of what I spend uh, on. So I think I'm I'm totally agree with you. The reporting is very very crucial, um, and the way of reporting it is also important. It is not only we say that we spend the money such mm -hmm. and such. How can we tracking? I mean, each penny that has been uh, paid, how can we track it and, and, and show the donor 
the, the impact of their donation. Because mm -hmm. in the end of the day, if I cannot see what is the impact of my uh, donation, I will feel, well, okay, I will, uh, it will be less, like a kind of, uh, of something that I a habit, I'm just uh, doing it uh, during the year. But we need to, to see the impact of, of that uh, donation. Does anyone in the Islamic social finance world actually have that impact reported in a third party kind of audited manner? Because they get the reports or, or the, the charities will do reporting, but you don't know if that's actually marketing as well, to say, give us more. Uh, but do you actually have like in the financial commercial world, you'll have audited accounts which are submitted to companies house. Is that a role for the UN that they can be that independent third party um, that they need to report to or they can assist in measuring impact? Um, I'm always say that uh, UN agencies, there are actually a, a kind of uh, safe channels. And this is what we need because um, in terms of uh, a due diligence, we uh, all the... Uh, the UN agencies doing the due diligence before uh, yeah. before even start the project. This is one, and and second, uh, the, the 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 transparency that has in a UN uh, it is very high standard, and uh, also the UN agencies has um, long experience on on that, uh, and this is why I am always encourage actually the NGOs, the government, even when I was as a, a director of uh, International Development Department and Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Qatar, I always encourage, encourage even the, uh, I mean, the countries or the, the government to engage more with the UN because, because the UN, it is, it's more safe and uh, we sure that uh, this money uh, won't be abused and, uh, uh, and uh, there, there is a very high uh, monitoring and evaluation and, um, and expert actually there. So yes, I think, I think this is what, what we need. We need to, yes, to see the impact and to, to have a proper, uh, a proper uh, uh, reporting that encourage uh, the, the donors even to give uh, to give more. I, I remember when I was also um, a humanitarian envoy um, and uh, I, I insist to not having uh, when I was I, I was chairing when I was a humanitarian uh, envoy, I was chair uh, the um, uh, high um, donor uh, group uh, for Syria. Uh, and and the countries was uh, around 14 countries who who paid more than 100 million uh, donation for for Syrian and I was insist to not having our meeting on the very fancy hotel rather than that I we should go and see the refugees on the in the camps and uh, looking what is their donation. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, has impact on the on the on the ground, and and the the the, the, the you cannot uh, imagine how this kind of idea uh, has can uh, has effect on on the on the government uh, members and uh, entity that they they saw by their own eyes how their donation helped the people, and this is what we need rather than show uh, like what, what's happening usually, how we give the, 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 the refugees or the people who are in need, they are standing in a queue and give them uh, food or shelter or whatever. No, we need to see it collectively. What is the impact of our donation has uh, in, in, in the ground? And moving, Towards um, so it's got one one final question for you, Dr. Almeriki. So bringing in the role of um, Islamic social finance to very much unlock commercial Islamic finance and the global Islamic finance and banking industry. Kind of what and there's a question from the audience which is very similar as well on this in terms of how does the UN perceive Islamic finance as an industry 
you know, uh, with its unique characteristics. But on in that regard, how can we use the mainstream commercial Islamic finance industry, which is moving more towards the SDGs, so that's your common language, how can that be unlocked by the work that you're doing? Or where do you see the intersectionality between the two? And have you got any examples or, or, or case studies you could share? Well, this is this is what are we doing now, uh, We are trying to find a, mecha a proper mechanism that within the international system, because as I told you, the people they are believe in what they are seeing more than what they are hearing or reading. So, so as as I I said in in my uh, opening remark that. Uh, there's many of the uh, UN agencies doing uh, Islamic social finance, um, but they are doing it individually rather than doing it in, in collectively. Uh, because the, if we work in collectively, uh, there, uh, there will be uh, an impact. And uh, if we give an example, so the Islamic uh, or commercial Islamic uh, 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 finance, they will come because because there is they will see by their own eyes how the impact of uh, the Islamic social finance, and we have uh, evidence from old days uh, when when the the, the the Islamic countries has uh, a proper system uh, implementing on the ground. Uh, where the, they spend money in education, in hospital, uh, in uh, homeless, in hospitality, and all that kind of, of, of uh, even on slave, how can the, the slave can uh, free themselves from, from uh, slaveness? So this is the idea that we, we need to have. I think if there is an international system like what we are looking for now, uh, and then we can see the impact on the ground. I think uh, uh, I think everybody will will follow the step uh, with what they what they are seeing. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mariki. I really appreciate you uh, joining us today. Very conscious it's an early start for you in New York, and you have an extremely busy schedule to to get into the UN building and all the other activities. So, thank you once again. Uh, Dr. Mariki for joining us and we look forward to hearing on the second phase now that you've successfully done the international dialogue um, and conversations. Uh, so thank you once again. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah and thank you to having me. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. And I will move now swiftly on to our next keynote guest uh, who's just joined us, Dr. Amjad Saqib. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Amjad, who is the chairman and founder of Akhuwat. Um, microfinance uh, institution in Pakistan. Welcome, uh, Dr. Andrew Sakib, and thank you for making time to join us today. Waalaikum assalam, sir, and thank you very much. I'm extremely honored that you invited me to this company of most distinguished scholars. Thank you very much. No, it's an absolute honor and delight to, to have you with us. So I've had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Amjad probably a decade plus ago uh, at some summit in Dubai and then actually taking a delegation of friends from Nigeria to visit your offices and the, the work that you're doing on the ground. And I have always remembered reading the academic literature saying interest-free um, microfinance is not possible. And by the way, we only charge 30, 40% to the poor people, which is sounds horrendous to some of us, but it's fine because the alternative loan sharks charge a few hundred uh, percent. So when I discovered the who uh, and what you had managed to do in terms of challenging conventional wisdom and actually demonstrating how you could deliver a sustainable, interest-free microcredit solution at scale, it was extremely impressive and hugely commendable. And indeed, uh, Dr. Andrew, I believe you've been nominated for, uh, for the Nobel Peace Prize for your efforts uh, on that as well. So look, an absolute pleasure to have you with us and we'd love to hear more from you. The floor is yours. I'll let you have your opening remarks and uh, on, on, on some of these issues and then we'll, we'll have a bit more of a fireside discussion. So over to yourself, Dr. Andrew. So thank you very much, sir. And uh, uh, let me pay my gratitude to you and to the distinguished panelists uh, of you know 
talking on such a wonderful issue which is so critical for poverty alleviation for making this world a happy place to live in so when we talk of inclusive society we talk of inclusive finance as well because without financial inclusion we can't achieve the dream of inclusive society inclusive society means when there is social inclusion when there is political inclusion when there is all kind of inclusion so how come without social uh, this financial inclusion we can give opportunity to the poor people to the most basic uh, financial services like credit savings insurance leasing and money transfer so there are different types of microfinance institutions financial institution i am not talking about the general finance i am particularly focusing because of the paucity of time only on microfinance which means small loans without collateral to the poor people so microfinance means uh, uh, you know credit savings insurance and uh, you know transfer of services to the poor people without collateral but the point is that uh, uh, you know the idea was started by ngos and uh, gradually it was taken over by the banks and now it has been turned into a, you know industry or a business so the uh, ngos uh, domination has been finished and the entire business is being taken by the banks and banks you know by definition is a profit maximizing institution there is no harm in uh, uh, you know taking profit but when you talk about the poor people i'm sure the poverty cannot be you know eradicated without being having us you know um, uh, friendship with them instead of doing the business with them now the next thing is that uh, would you like to go for a conventional microfinance which charges 30 40% over and above the cap cost of capital it includes includes cost of capital cost of operations cost of default cost of growth and profit etc etc but we 20 years ago started with an experiment that uh, there is a product in every society nothing islamic but every society where you give 100 dollars to your friend or your relative or your you know brother or sister and you take back 100 dollars this is called qarz e hasan or you can translate it as benevolent loan that means loan given on benevolence uh, just as a mode of support to your brother or sister and you will take back the 100 amount 100 dollars so we thought that if it is uh, a very preferred mode and common in every uh, you know society so why don't we uh, you know uh, transfer it into uh, you know instead of only an individual practice why can't we institutionalize this practice so that means if we have plenty of money uh, you know either uh, donated or raised by you know sadqats and adyats and if there is an organization which is the custodian of that money that money could be provided to the poor people on the qarz e hasan uh, model qarz e hasan basis so initially we gathered around uh, say uh, 2000 dollars and we identified 10 to 20 uh, people who wanted to do business and they wanted to avoid interest because this was against their faith and this was against their ideology so we treated them as our friends as our brothers as i mentioned that qarz e hasan means giving something some loan to your brother and sister without any you know profit so we Uh, uh, said that these are our brethren these are our you know brothers and sisters and we are in solidarity with them we will give them loan and we will not charge anything extra even the cost of operation will not be charged so this was the beginning and uh, very soon the entire amount came back and the people were happy and they started their businesses they started sending their children to school and they had uh, you know uh, something better to eat at the end of the day and uh, then we told this story to more people the more people gave donations and so that credit pool which became a revolving fund continued to increase 
then gradually you know there were no rules procedures and principles we were doing an action research it was an organic activity that we were doing something learning making mistakes correcting those mistakes but the basic idea was having a fund and being a custodian of that fund and transferring that fund to the economically active people who are trustworthy credit worthy ask them inspire them to invest entire amount on their business and earn money and then return back so that was the beginning and by now alhamdulillah uh, we have dispersed more than 100 uh, about more than 1000 million us dollars to around 4 million families in pakistan so the entire money let me say it again was gathered uh, in donations to some support from the government and that pool uh, you know uh, grew bigger and bigger and uh, because it was not uh, taken on market rates so it was zero so we were able to transfer that money on zero basis and uh, uh, you know this uh, 40 uh, you know 4 million families have been given 1000 more than 1000 million us dollars and the best thing is that uh, the recovery percentage is 99.9 which will certainly surprise you but uh, you know we firmly believe that uh, as allah almighty in his divine book has said that i increase sadaqa and i decrease riba so this is the sadaqa this is the blessing of sadaqa and sincerity and interest free lending that uh, the model is increasing consolidating expanding and uh, you know standing the test of time you know two years 20 years is a sufficient time we had many you know yeah. catastrophic events earthquakes covid and recent floods in pakistan but despite that people you know honor their promise take the money and then give back the money so that that money could be given to somebody else another dimension which will interest you is that when they be, when we give this money to these people we tell them that look today you are taking money but tomorrow we would like you to be giving money to somebody else so we would like to reciprocate that if somebody has supported you then you will also support somebody so instead of a vicious cycle we are creating a positive cycle so this is extremely important to build a society that we are not only giving money but we are trying to build a society where everybody believes in giving sharing and solidarity with one another and uh, uh, it is again a great player that 60% of our poor borrowers who took money to start a business they have now become our donors they give say 1 dollar a month but that petty amount when you know Uh, is uh, uh, given by uh, around 1 million borrowers becomes a huge amount and that comes to the same pool and it is again recycled revolved amongst the poor people so primarily we derive this inspiration from the spirit of mabahat taught by holy prophet peace be upon him that if one per- person who is uh, rich uh, makes one person his friend who is poor then both of them will be better so we think that in pakistan if 50% 50% are poor and 50% are not poor if we are able to establish a bond of solidarity and love between these two halves then we have a chance of uh, you know building a society and if we expand this to the whole world we can say that 50% of the world 4 billion are poor and 4 billion are not poor so if these two sections of society have and have not join hands and there is universal brotherhood and the manifestation of brotherhood is through giving these small loans so that we can you know make this world a better place uh, to live in so this is very briefly you know our story this is the biggest uh, microfinance industry microfinance program in the world we have more than 800 offices and uh, we have 1 million around uh, active borrowers we have served 4 million families and we are present in all four corners of uh, pakistan and we are experimenting and uh, you know sharing this idea in afghanistan in india in bangladesh in uh-huh. some african countries but there still it is in pilot phase 
uh, you know, it hasn't gone to scale. But uh, we believe that this uh, system is doable the, uh, because this is the two way. This is not charity. You are not giving somebody and not getting it back. You are giving somebody and getting it back. And at the same time, you are inspiring him to give somebody else. So this is an economy of reciprocity where we are, you know, helping each other and trying to develop a mutual support system. The basic objective is financial inclusion without compromising anybody's faith or his ideological uh, thoughts. And uh, every religion, it is not confined to Islam, every Abrahamic religion and even Hinduism prohibits uh, interest. So uh, we firmly believe that uh, uh, this interest is one of the major reasons why the poor are poor and why uh, you know two billion billion people are living in less than one dollar a day. So I conclude over here. And if you have any questions, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Andrew. That that that's absolutely fascinating what you described. So. What you've just said there right at the end that interest you feel is also a cause of the problems which is fascinating for us in the commercial banking world uh, because it's not mentioned financial instruments toxic financial instruments not actually mentioned or addressed um, directly within the un sustainable development goals which is which is interesting but before we go to that i want to come back to to a couple of things just to unpack for for those people viewing this Two questions. Uh, number one, the fundamental operations, if you just give a brief answer, and I'm sure you've been asked this many times, non-performing loans and operational costs, how are they met if you cannot charge interest? Number one. Yeah. And number two question is around, yeah, I'll, yeah go for that yeah. first. You know, uh, the, this, uh, uh, the whole system runs on uh, the spirit of solidarity and giving. So if you give us $100, our operational cost is say 10%. So we will keep 10% in our operational account and put that 90% in our loan account, revolving fund. That $90 will go as a loan to somebody. And after one year, it, come, it will come back $90 because our recovery is 99.9%. .9%. So again, we will take out $10, put it in our operational pool, and $80 will be given to the next borrower. In third year, that $10 will, that $80 will come back, and again, we will take out $10, and $70 will be given as a loan. So this will continue till 10 years, unless the entire amount becomes zero. So now your question is very valid, that it means, after 10 years, you will have to stop this operation. But we believe that you, as a compassionate and empathetic man, will not give, be giving $100 only for the first year. You will also give the second year, in third year, in fourth year, because you believe in giving. So this is tawakkal. This is the firm belief that society is full of good people. If you will stop giving, Somebody else will enter your shoes and he will give this money to us. So the uh, truthfulness of the evidence of my argument is this, that we started this with, with the uh, $2,000 and we have distributed 1,000 million US dollars. Mm -hmm. That means there is no dearth of people who are giving. Mm -hmm. So we don't transfer the operational cost to the borrower, we continue to harness the potential of the people who believe in giving. So this is, the, the economists never believe us. They say that, no, this is not a workable model because yeah. one day there is no more funding, no more support, then you will be stopped. But we say that where economic principles end, the principles of mawakhat are giving start. This is beginning, you know, this, the entire, you know, paradigm is built on this spirit that people are willing to give and then people who get this money are willing to give it back. So our operational expenses are also borne by you, the donor who is, 
you know, developing a bond of solidarity with a poor person. So, we, uh, you know, the success is in front of you. So, so, so this narrative that you're using there, Dr. Amjad, is fascinating. It's talking about spirit of solidarity. Um, you're talking about trust and belief. Now, for the, what then advice would you give? Or what would you say to commercial bankers and financiers working in the mainstream world, looking to earn a return, but also do good? Because they have this, con this, this, this kind of clash between is there a compromise on profits if we follow an ESG or if we follow Sharia compliant mechanisms or requirements and rules? And they're always balancing these two challenges. What would, what would you advise them? My on? advice is you know, they, they should divide you know, financial services in two parts. One part should be earning money. They should give money to corporate sector, to commercial sector, to small and medium, and they should earn money from there. They should do it on Islamic principles of uh, profit and loss. But they should also have one window for Kazi Hassan. You know, there are two types of products, savings and current. In saving, you give profit to the deposit depositor, but in current, you take the entire amount and the depositor doesn't get anything from you. So on the same analogy, why don't you create a pool of money for the poor people whom you give actual amount and take actual amount back? Mm -hmm. You know, this is going something extraordinary. This is something out of box. This is something more creative, which demands sacrifice, which demands compassion. If you, do, if you are doing pure banking, then you are a profit maximizing institution and you are working for the shareholders. But I am trying to add one thing more that uh, in a capitalistic society, if you don't add compassion, then 4 billion people will always remain in poverty. Mm. If you want the solution of the power, do you want to earn money? Do you want to enhance your own market share? That's fine. The, uh, the, the capitalistic system is made for that. It will enrich you. But if in this capitalist system, you add on compassion and this desire to serve the poor people, because Islam is not against capitalism. Uh -huh. Islam you know, just adds that whatever is more than your needs, you should distribute it. It is against accumulation of wealth. It is against concentration of wealth. It is against, you know, uh, just thinking about your own self. So if you want to really build a society on the principles of equity, then you will have to come out of, you know, that uh, mode of thinking for your own self. So my advice for the banking is that uh, since 300 years you have been doing banking to earn profit for yourself. Now you should make it, you know, a win-win situation. You earn money and part of that money should also go to the poor people so that they can start a business. And ultimately I tell you that more people you take out of poverty, the more banks will be become richer, richer, richer. So this is a you know win-win situation. Our experience is that uh, more people come out of poverty, there will be more prosperity. You will be able to sell your products if you are a mill owner. So uh, who will buy your products if their people are poor? So, if, so take if, people out of poverty. Hmm. Dr. So if it is a win-win situation, and I follow everything you said there. So how are you finding the engagement with the Islamic finance, the commercial Islamic finance and banking sector in Pakistan? Are they interacting yes. with yourself? Yeah. How, how is that relationship? We are working with them. You know, our inclusive model for, uh, has four sections. Our financial inclusive model. Uh, we say, for example, we say 10% people are uh, extremely poor widows, old age, disabled, they should be given zakat. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then there are 30% people who are uh, not uh, 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 you know, disabled, who are active, 
economically active and they uh, should be given karz hasan that means without interest loan and then next 30% they should be given loans on profit and loss sharing basis mm -hmm. and the last thing is the 10% people who are already rich they have the collateral and they can go to the banks and get the loans so the whole concept revolves on the financial inclusion those people who need zakat those people who need qarz e hasan those people who need you know profit and loss sharing basis and then obviously uh, you know the richer people who don't need uh, uh, these services they can go they have the collateral and go to the bank so we are preparing uh, uh, you know people who will you know graduate from uh, interest free model to a profit loss sharing model uh, for the islamic banks right. so we have close collaboration and coordination Okay, so you're stratifying it out and, and, and going, and that answers actually one of the questions that was raised around the different uh, segments there. But but also building on that question, the question uh, chap has asked around who it's different from Grameen Bank. I think fundamentally Grameen Bank charges interest. So that's the number one key difference. Is, is, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, Grameen Bank is a, a, a remarkable institution. It introduced financial inclusion. But the basic difference is that we believe in Islamic uh, uh, mode of Qarz e Hasan. We are not just the extension of capitalism, but contrary to it, uh, uh, Grameen Bank believes in uh, uh, you know sustainability through its uh, borrowers. So it charges interest. So this is very fundamental ideological difference. Okay, and 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 just building on that, uh, the last part of that question is a question we had as well. And you just touched on it there. One of the challenges the academic literature has shown for all of microfinance has always been this demonstrating a graduation effect. Are individuals actually moving out of poverty and moving up uh, the, 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 the kind of um, levels there? What's your experience? Does the interest free lending at who would speed up that process? Is there evidence that they actually get out of this cycle? Or are there other prevailing yeah. factors which just. As I mentioned, you, that's it. As I mentioned you, that 60% of our borrowers are now our donors. Mm -hmm. so what other evidence will you need that people mm -hmm. are not more extreme poor? Whosoever donates, it doesn't matter how little he donates, but if somebody donates, it means he's not extra poor. He's not the dirt poor. He's not the absolute poor. So, you know, our experience is, that if you give people interest-free loan, if you trust them, if you have a bond of love with them, and we don't say people that we are here to give you money. We say that we are here to have a brotherhood. We have a relationship with you. And as a brother, we would like to uh, see you moving in life. And you, if you need money, you take money from us. So we are not a lending organization per se. We are uh, an organization which is trying to build a society on the basis of uh, sharing and solidarity which in islam we call mawakhat yeah. so our experience is uh, that uh, uh, interest free lending is uh, extremely extremely useful but the challenge for us is to have resources the more resources we will get the more uh, you know uh, depth we will achieve more scale we will reach and, uh, and these are the basic things and then again, replication, it needs commitment. It needs, uh, you know, a uh, very strong determination and uh, uh, selflessness. The entire team of Akhova, which comprises of uh, selfless people who believe in the ideology. You know, the first thing is belief. If you believe, believe that uh, interest-free finance is possible, then you will, only then you are able to do that. And uh, this belief comes from the, uh, you know, Holy Quran, which says that, uh, you know, uh, uh, God increases sadaka and decreases the riba. So this belief, this faith and commitment and determination plus resources and advocates like you, who, you know, share this story with the rest of the world, that is the, uh, you know, biggest uh, 
thing for us. This is how we will, you know, go globally. This is how we will expand the model. And, uh, you know, there is no sing one single model. We should be doing whatever we believe in. If you believe that 40% uh, 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 interest rate, you are ending poverty, you know, God be with you. But if you think that at 0%, you can make more impact, then you should wish me best. So we should work together. We should work in tandem. I have no reason to criticize anybody who charges interest. So that's the way nobody should, you know, object that we are. People say that you are distorting market. I would just tell me that if you are giving people at 0%, is it distortion of market? If something which is done for the betterment of the poor, would you call it, uh, you know, distorting of market? A five-star hotel, you know, sells a drink at uh, $10 and a small shop in front of that uh, five-star hotel sells the same uh, drink at $1. So it's a free word. Everybody has the, you know, uh, should have been given the, uh, the permission to do as per, you know, their own experience. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Amjusaka. That, that really, really is a, a phenomenal journey you've been on, most commendable and, and impressive, and, and so many lessons uh, in there for, for conventional bankers. If I could ask you one last piece, if there is something you would like to see um, from the global Islamic finance industry, and secondly, from the United Nations, what advice or what would you like to see from them that you think can support your work or can support the journey of your work, the, 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 the objective of your work? You know, we don't need money. We don't ask for money. If I ask for money, I will ask from the people of Pakistan because it is their responsibility to help their poor. My, if I uh, uh, ask something from you and uh, from any other institution, from your institution, that is give us opportunity to explain this model. Help us to take to other uh, countries. So, you know, uh, organize some events, some seminars, some webinars, or give us opportunity to personally go to different areas, different countries and continents and present this model. So in this context, we just want your support to tell the people that, look, there is an alternate model as well. We don't need money. We have, you know, God is enough for us. Uh, we will not ask for any money, but this support is extremely critical. I need your support. People say that you have a great story, but there is no storyteller. We want you to become our storyteller. You come to Pakistan and see our uh, website, see all the, uh, you know, uh, financial statements and all those things, meet our borrowers. Mm -hmm. And if you find that this is, uh, you know, worthwhile, then please join us. The word, you cannot end poverty by doing business with the poor. You can only end poverty by doing friendship with the poor. That's my last slope word. Beautiful. Beautifully said, and I think beautiful words to conclude uh, this, the third and final um, part of our uh, series on Islamic finance and the UN SDGs. A huge thank you once again, Dr. Amjad Saqib, um, to yourself and all of the team at Akhuwa for the immensely commendable work that you're doing. Um, we for sure at the UK Islamic Finance Council and our, our partners are more than happy to support and no doubt the teams will get in touch. I'm coming, I'm coming to UK in the first week of October, so we can meet there if you like. Absolutely, inshallah, we definitely will. I hope to welcome you to, to Scotland indeed for that matter if you if you are uh, yeah, please send, up to Glasgow. So please we'll send me the, the contact and phone numbers. I'm coming to Glasgow as well. Absolutely. I will send you that, but not on this webinar right now with another few other people watching. It will be lovely to, to, to see you in, in, in the UK. And thank you once again to, to uh, Dr. Amjad for giving us your, your precious time. Um, really fascinating insights there from, from Dr. Amjad on um, changing 
really changing the goalpost. And we talk in conventional finance around profit and purpose. We're talking about integrating ESG. So I think there's a beautiful journey there in defining purpose um, as, as, as a whole has gone through and definitely a lot in there for Islamic financial institutions and conventional financial institutions who are seeking to, um, you know, kind of uh, identify or re, uh, re-identify the purpose and the soul of their uh, organization. Uh, we wish you well, um, and Dr. Andrews and everyone at Akhuwa, and we wish all the people of Pakistan well. Also, we know you're going through very challenging and devastating floods recently, um, and we would encourage everyone to look at the Akhuwa website and see uh, and learn more and see where they can support. So thank you once again. Thank you to all uh, who've been watching and partaking in this three-part series. Um, the next step for, for the UKIC is supporting the partnering with the Global Ethical Finance Initiative in launching the Path to COP28 program, which will be done um, on the 24th of October in Dubai. That will be a 12 month program running up to the COP28 that will be held in Dubai. And we look forward to your engagement then. And Dr. Andrew, look forward to seeing you in the UK. Thank, Thank you very you. much, sir. Bye-bye. Take care, Salam alaikum, bye-bye.